Okay, um, so I'm Robert Satterford, I'm from Cognition. Um, I'll talk about what we do shortly. Um, I'm going to explain what Cognition is and how it works and why we built it. Um, and then I'm going to jump into a little bit about what Pleasure is, programming language. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? So I don't know how much you got of that, but let's carry on. Um, I'm going to talk about what Cognition is, uh, why we built it, talk about what Clojure is and why we use it, um, and then dive into our architecture. Um, and a lot of that talk will be about Datomic, the database engine we use. Before we get started, um, a disclaimer, we're not running at scale yet. We only launched this stack a couple months ago. Uh, we're only at 1,000 users. Um, but as you'll see, we think this stack is quite scalable, um, very scalable, in fact. And I hope um, that we have another scale comp next year, and I can come and show you how things are going. So about our startup. I started with started Cognition with Barry and Patrick in uh, 2010. Um, we started building the concept for this uh, app with good old LAMP and Flex and Air, um, and that very quickly became old. Um, it was just shortly before Steve Jobs killed Flash, so that was fun. Um, <clears throat> and then about 18 months into doing that, um, we started the rebuild. We proved the concept out. People liked what we had, but now we needed to get serious. So I started rebuilding with uh, Google Clojure JavaScript, which is a very verbose way of doing JavaScript. And several months later, an 11,000 soul, 11, soul crushing lines of JavaScript later, uh, I discovered Clojure um, and decided to reevaluate. As you can see, uh, I wrote, rewrote the model portion of this app in two weeks and just 1,500 lines. Um, and that was when I decided we needed to switch. So that's that. So what is Cognition? I'm just going to read this, because this is written by somebody who's far better at that I am. Um, the Cognition methodology is based on the premise that if you want to, ask, want to change the way someone thinks, you must change the questions they ask. Our COGS, or conversational guides, are essentially a script of provocative questions. Questions designed to get the learner to explore challenges from new perspectives. They are the kinds of questions an expert will ask about the challenge at hand. In using a COG, a learner gets the chat, a question or challenge the way an expert would. And by questioning like an expert over time, the learner begins to think like one. So that's the, the, the concept that we proved we can work. Uh, work. Um, so, I'll just talk to you through what's going on the interface here. Um, we've got questions on the see my cursor. <clears throat> questions on the left, and the, the, the learner has decided to um, uh, learn about critical thinking, and so we introduce the concept a little uh, over here, and then we start asking them questions and get, getting them to uh, think about what they know about critical thinking and um, start to unpack their own context about it. Um, and through working through these cogs, which takes about half an hour to 45 minutes, they, we hopefully change the way they think about it a little bit. So um, learners proceed on a learning path through several cogs, um, a bundle of cogs around a particular topic, such as critical thinking or conflict management or being tenacious or being um, prolific in your work. Um, these cogs work together to supplement the learner with alternate thinking models. We want to change the way that you think about things. And when uh, taken together, they bring about quite a significant positive change in the, the nature and the quality of their thinking. So we get them to think almost above their pay grade. Um, some COGS, we do have um, sliders or uh, you know, fixed value inputs where we um, allow the, the learner to assess their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the point here is not that we're testing them, but getting them to think about their own thinking and think about how they approach problem solving. Um, and then we use those assessments to um, guide them into the other cogs in the, um, the bundle and show them where they need to work. So over here we've got um, that assessment produced all of these values. Um, and those values then, you know, I can see that I'm, sorry. I can see that I'm strong in some areas and weak in others. And so I know where to focus my time. Um, these learners use cognition in groups. Um, so, and we'll, you'll have a school context or a university context or a corporate context. Um, and so to provoke a little bit of competition, we put them all on the leaderboard to see who's actually putting the most effort in. Um, and it also helps uh, people to, uh, helps learners to understand what other people are learning. Um, the final piece of the, the front end puzzle is the notion of insights. 
at key points in the COGS. We ask users to share an insight about what they've learned in that session, and that gets shared out to the group. And then everybody can see those insights and comment and respond, and it becomes a bit of a social network around thinking about ideas. Um, so that's the front end side of cognition in a, a couple minutes. Um, then the people who actually buy cognition from us for their users, they need to understand how people are experiencing cognition and how well it's going. So we have an, an admin backend for them to use. And you can see engagement and also by reading the insights, you can actually see the qualitative effect of cognition on their people. <clears throat> Quickly look at who uses cognition. So the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation, they do bursaries for uh, university students and they're hoping to find the next guy who's going to start a Discovery Health um, and be, get in on the ground with them. So they're trying to find and nurture entrepreneurs. Um, and the, the COGS that you just saw are the COGS that these students are using. There's 120 COGS on various soft skills and different ways of approaching problem solving. Um, Internet solutions are using it uh, for quite a different uh, uh, reason. They're using it as a performance support tool for business analysis. So we built a suite of COGS for them that help them unpack a business case. Um, and finally, SICAN, who we've partnered with, um, do executive uh, leadership coaching. So they are the guys coaching the, telco, the new telecom CEO on how to actually do what they do. Um, and we've, we're taking the knowledge that they use in instructor-led training and coaching and making a digital product out of it so that it, they can reach more people. So that's cognition in four minutes. Closure. First of all, who knows what it is? Show of hands. OK, about 20% of you. Who's using it? All three of you. Awesome. <laughs> Who's using it in production? All three of you. Good. OK, so I have a new crowd here. That's good. So closure is a modern Lisp dialect. Um, Lisp comes from 1950 Futsec. Um, it's a general purpose functional language. It's a modern. Uh, uh, functional language, so it understands today's world of the web um, and just large distributed systems. It uses immutable data structures um, rather than allowing you to create objects and change their values without keeping track of what changed. Everything is immutable. You create something, it stays in memory. If you want to change it, you create a new copy and you change the bits that you need. Um, it's available on the JVM. It produces JavaScript. It's avail available on the CLI, um, which is .NET. Um, and there are many people uh, putting it in other places. There's an iOS development. There's a port to C. Um, there's a Python port. So it's, it's going everywhere. So let's look at a quick sample. Um, so this is a full closure program. It's a web application, a very, very, very simple one. First, we have a function defined called handler. Um, and all it does is accept a web request and return a web response. Um, and in this particular case, we're using a library called Ring, which um, uh, abstracts over the, the details of dealing with HTTP. Um, and it returns a map of three keys, status, headers, and body. Um, and the key thing here is that the body um, is a function of the request that's going in. Um, so we're taking the request and we're transforming the request into this response. Um, we're not storing state anywhere. All we're doing is transforming data over time. Um, once we have this function defined, oh, the other cool thing here is that um, we have a simple um, uh, DSL for generating HTML, which has got nothing to do with the DSL for dealing with HTTP. We're composing small, separate libraries to create a bigger whole. Um, then finally, we hand that pure function over to uh, Jetty, and that gives us a web application. And as you might expect, if I send um, nothing to it, all I'm going to get is he hello scale come for you said. And if I send to the JSON blob, it would re re repeat that back. Um, so that's closure in a minute and a half. Um, and there will be time for, for questions during lunch. I'll be happy to answer anything you want to ask. Um, so how have we built our system? Cognition's architecture is much like you would expect. Uh, web nodes in the front, um, worker nodes in the back. We're currently on um, Amazon Web Services. We have three servers. Um, we have two web servers, mostly because we want to be able to um, uh, uh, have zero downtime deploys. We don't actually need them for scale yet. Um, and one worker node server, which hosts basically everything except the web nodes. Um, <clears throat> 
uh, our main app, that first screenshot you saw with the questions, is a ClojureScript application, which compiles down to JavaScript. Um, and that reuses or it uses what Google Clojure uses for their own JavaScript applications like Google Plus and Gmail. Um, and it produces really, really small, fast, performant JavaScript. Um, so the way that the app actually works, um, as you interact with it, a load a cog, um, get a new question, answer a question, all that we're doing is sending events off to the server to say what happened. Um, we're not actually storing a document at any point. Um, the, uh, those events are tagged with the version of the application, um, they're timestamped, all those sorts of things. Um, and also any JavaScript errors that occur, and there are many, um, uh, thanks to plugins, um, are also uh, sent to the server as events. So when things go wrong, we can actually see the timeline of what happened. Um, <clears throat> The other thing about this is that um, with mobile and occasionally connected devices, um, we store all of those events in local storage first, and only once we are sure the server has them do we remove them from local storage. So that helps us to um, support um, mobile devices. Um, okay. The other cool thing about using Clojure Script on the front and Clojure on the back is that we get to share code. So the code that produces these events, um, the model code that produces these events, is exactly the same code that we used to understand those events on the server. It's literally the same text files on disk that gets compiled into both places. And the data moving between the two is also closure data. No JSON or JavaScript. Then we look at our web architecture. As I said, we have two nodes for um, um, zero downtime deploy. They're um, sitting behind an, uh, Amazon's Elastic Load Balancer. Um, all of our static stuff is on S3. The, the web nodes are only responsible for dynam dynamic requests. Um, and the web server is actually very, very simple in terms of how it's built. There's no big complicated framework. Um, it's just ring for HTTP, composure with a J um, for routing um, requests to functions. And then when we need to generate HTML, we use a library called Hiccup, which can turn um, simple closure data structures into HTML. And all 11,000 lines of code in the code base is just simple compositions of those three things, just lots of it. Um, all of our session data in memcached, we've seen that many times already. Um, the server is responsible for storing all of the events of the client and adding its own events to that same stream. Uh, for example, when a user tries to uh, log in and they can't, we can we log that. Um, Every time they visit an important page, we log that. All of the um, errors that occur, server-side exceptions, it all gets logged into one stream that we can then go and inspect. Um, <clears throat> once all of the events are stored in our database, Datomic, which I'll get to in a bit, they're all also um, enqueued in RabbitMQ so that our worker node can do whatever it needs to do with it, every single event. And in terms of how we scale this particular part, um, all we need to do is add web nodes. The code base is 100% stateless. There's no internal state. So we can switch them off and switch them on, add another 10, reduce down to two again. Um, it doesn't affect our, we don't have any downtime. It just works. Very cool. The worker nodes, only input is the event queue from Rabbit. Um, it does two main things with that. One, it processes all those events to find out what uh, information we can glean. For example, if they use a cog, we want to know how far they are. We calculate a percentage. If there are uh, sliders and such in that cog, there's um, aggregations that we do on that data. Um, uh, and usage counters and all that sort of stuff. And that, that data is what powers our leaderboards and our, um, our group uh, admin stats. Um, the other thing, the important thing that we do is uh, send outbound email. So our web nodes never have to deal with any long running processes. They just queue it off. Um, and all the email goes out. Um, in terms of how this worker node is built, pure functions and um, the, mem the, the, the RabbitMQ client um, and HTML, uh, hiccup for HTML. There's no big overarching framework or library involved. Um, and again, if we want to scale this, we just add nodes. We can, if we find that our RabbitMQ is getting so full and we can't get the work done, we can spin up another node in 10 minutes and we, 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 we uh, double our capability. Um, and that's the web and the worker. So we've covered the three main areas that our code lives. Um, just by comparison um, to our previous stack, which is uh, LAMP and Flex and Air, 
Um, this code base is 22,000 lines of closure, all in, um, for everything, um, and about 2,000 lines of Python and Bash to do the, the, the server deployments. Um, whereas the previous code base, which was not at all scalable, beyond a single beefy server, um, is double that. And we have a much more scalable system with this code. So before we jump into the database side of this, let's have a look at what Datomic actually is. Um, anybody know what it is? Show of hands. Okay, so a number of you. So here's the Wikipedia entry. I'll just let you read that. And it really is. You might be reading this, um, have a high scale system in place and say, well, yes, it can, I can understand how it does four of those, but how does it do the fifth one? But it, um, from experience, I can tell you that it actually does all of that. So let's look at how Datomic models data in the database. It's quite different to um, NoSQL or SQL databases. Um, first of all, um, everything in the database is represented as entity attribute value tuples or what they call datums. Um, the entity part of that is really just an ID. It's just a unique number. Um, any mix of attributes can be put on any entity. So you can have a user entity with just a user, an email address and a password, or a user entity with an email address, a password, 20 groups, whatever the case may be, and there's no cost to having a big entity um, next to a small entity. Everybody hear me? Okay. So um, the schema for Datomic defines what attributes can do, rather than what entities can do. And for example, schema um, defines things like the name, the data type, whether or not that value should be indexed, whether it should be unique in the, in, in the database, and whether or not an, an entity can have one or many of that value. Um, then relationships between entities are just really another type of attribute. Um, and relationships between entities are implicitly bidirectional. If I say that a user has um, many groups, those groups implicitly have those users as well. So let's look at what that schema definition looks like. First of all, we define a user email address. It's a string. Um, a user can only have one, of, one email at a time. Um, the email has to be unique in the entire database, and we want to index it for query speed. Um, a, a user group reference is really just an entity on this side and entities on this side. And that's what the ref defines, and we say that there can be many. We don't have to index it because Refs are in, implicitly indexed, and um, we don't need it to be unique either. So, is this a fact? Or is this a fact? That's a fact. That is just a statement. The reason this is a fact is because it's rooted in time. I can say that Robert likes beer at any time, and it, it's, it's just a statement. It doesn't actually have much meaning. But if I say Robert like, likes beer today, that is a fact. Um, tomorrow, it will have been a fact that today I like beer. Um, <laughs> so um, it will always be true for today, even if it changes tomorrow. It never changes. It's anchored in time. Datomic has an implicit or a, a, a built-in model of time. Um, new information enters the database as transactions, and those transactions are just lists of assertions and retractions of datums. So Robert likes beer. Robert does not like coffee. Uh, Robert likes coffee. Every datum value in the database is linked to the transaction that caused it, and every transaction is timestamped. So that means every value in the database is implicitly timestamped, and there's no avoiding that. You, you don't ever have a piece of data that doesn't have a timestamp in the database. So in Datomic, you actually have EAVT, Entity Attribute Value Time, and that's what makes it a fact database rather than just a database as a container of, of um, the data. Um, <clears throat> so the cool thing about that is that because all of the data that you put into Datomic over time is there, no matter what you say is new at the end uh, or today, you can query back into the past. You can say, what was in my database last week? Or what was true last week? Don't worry about what happened after that. Tell me what happened last week. You can also um, uh, say, um, uh, uh, constrain your query to a certain particular point in time or a certain range in time. You can say, show me everything that just happened between Monday and Friday and ignore everything else. And this is a great way to um, 
uh, to get good performance out of Datomic if you have a lot of data. Um, and the now query, if you write a SQL query that shows you your world as it is now, um, it can be quite difficult to do that across many queries, especially if you're building up a dashboard. Um, the, the truth of that uh, set of queries is that it'll actually be now spread over um, a, a half a second or whatever the case may be. In Datomic, every query gets past a database and every database value is at a point in time. So you can be absolutely certain that you're looking at exactly the same data, which is pretty cool. So here's how a query looks. Um, in this query, this is Datalog, which is a, um, a variant of Prolog, which is another ancient programming language, which I don't really understand, but I understand this. Um, so this says, find me all the entities in the database that have an email address. So there could be, there could be users, there could be uh, groups that have an admin user, an admin email address to contact. It could be uh, an exception reporting entity that says this is the email you have to contact. But the point is, is that this will find all the entities that just have that um, attribute on it. Very simple. Um, this is a more complicated one, um, typically the sort of thing you do when writing a login. Um, find me the user and the password where the email is rabbit at cognition.com. So what's happening here is the user is coming in, oh sorry, the, the, the email comes into the query, it uses the email to back reference to the user to find the user, and then it uses the user to forward reference to find the password. So you can have values on either side of the relationship and find the other side. Um, and the other thing that's happening here is that you have two clauses and both of those clauses essentially are an and, as you would do in SQL. Um, the other thing that's happening here is that there's, a, there's essentially a join, like a SQL join happening here between user email and user password. And all joins in Datomic are implicit and automatic. There's no having to manually write out join this to join, this to join uh, that. Um, this query is quite cool. Um, we have a user, um, me, um, and we want to find all of the users that are in all of the groups that I'm in. So in SQL, this would be a little bit more complicated, I think. Um, but here we're saying, take me, find all my groups, and then use my groups to find all of the me's that are linked to those groups. Um, and why I'm showing this is not because it's a difficult thing to do, but um, it's a very concise thing that you can do in Datomic. Um, the other thing about Datomic is because the database is implicitly a part of this, um, this uh, entity attribute value uh, tuple, you can actually query across databases. So I could inject um, a different database into, into each one of these clauses and query across two different databases of data. Um, the other thing is that you can, because query, and you'll see why in a minute, query happens inside your application process, you can query um, over data sets that aren't in Datomic or you could join data sets that aren't in Datomic to data sets that are, um, which is quite cool. So that's, in a nutshell, um, how Datomic looks as a developer. So let's look at how it fits into our architecture. Um, so Datomic, instead of being one process where everything happens inside it, like in MySQL, where it's a black box and query and indexing and optimization and storage and all that stuff happens inside, uh, inside there, Datomic has been broken up into three different parts. Um, the three are the transactor, the storage, and the query, which lives inside your app process. So if we look at the transactor, the only thing a transactor does is store novelty. Anything that's new in your system, that's all that the transactor has to do. It transacts them, and when the trans transaction succeeds, it puts, uh, rebuilds the index that they belong to, and then stores that index off to storage. The other cool thing that it's doing is automatically notifying all of the connected peers about the changes that are occurring. So the peers are automatically kept up to date. Um, it does not perform query at all, except when you uh, need to run a transaction that needs to first look up data as it's performing that transaction. And you'd only do that when you need transactional consistency. Um, we haven't needed to use it yet, though. Um, so then there's storage. Storage can be anywhere. Um, the way that Datomic stores its data is just simple, simple chunks of index um, blocks. Um, you can store it in SQL, in Couchbase, in DynamoDB, on disk, or in memory. Um, and that's great for testing. 
We're currently using a single Postgres server, um, and when our data finally does become big, we'll move over to DynamoDB, I guess. Um, then the most interesting part of, so those two um, things um, make this last piece the most interesting. Um, the, the query portion of Datomic lives inside the, um, your application process along with the rest of your code. Um, when you uh, create new data and send it off, um, the, the, the peer library is sending it off to the transactor, and that's, what the, that's when it talks to the transactor. But when it needs to query over data, it doesn't talk to the transactor at all. It talks to storage directly. So in a system where you need high read scalability and moderate write scalability, this is great because um, you just need a big storage and big peers, or lots of peers. Um, so the way that it is actually able to do that um, the way that it's actually able to do that is before performing the query that you wanted it to do, it'll first go and find the index segments out of storage and cache them in memory. Um, and once it's found the right ones and they're loaded, it'll expand them in memory and then perform the query over the data set um, right there. The benefit to that is if you query the same data often, you've got automatic transparent caching for those queries in your, in your um, worker and web um, processes. Because all of the data in Datomic is immutable, once it goes in, it stays there. Um, we don't ever need to invalidate these caches. They can stay warm forever. Um, and um, because uh, uh, you might have a limited amount of RAM on your peer, um, you might have terabytes of data but only care about half a gig of it, um, it'll automatically throw away the oldest bits of data that it has in cache until, you know, so that you always get a good read performance. So um, that's how query does its work. Um, and that's why query is able to do things like query across different databases because it's not actually go going over there to perform query. It's bringing everything into memory and then doing what it needs to do there. Um, so if we have to reboot these web servers or these um, worker servers once we get to many of them, obviously we're going to lose that cache um, and have to warm that cache up all over again. And that's where memcached comes in. So memcached is a shared second level cache. Um, and the peers, instead of going to storage, they will first go and look at memcached for whatever they need. Um, and memcached acts like another peer in the system when Datomic is um, broadcasting novelty out. So you'll find that many times the first request for a new piece of data will be served directly out of cache rather than out of storage. So when we eventually do move to DynamoDB because we have so much data, we'll only really be, um, we'll, our read provisioning will be quite low because all of our query will be coming out of cache. The other cool thing is that if you use a clustered memcached um, uh, or a memcache cluster, you can actually take um, an otherwise unclustered storage and turn it into a clustered, um, uh, you know, st give it a high read scalability with memcached in this way. Um, thank again, again, thanks to the immutability in the data, um, this cache stays warm; it heats up and stays hot. Um, and because of that, we can actually restart all of the other pieces of our infrastructure without losing that performance. So um, we roll out code multiple times a day. Um, Datomic is still quite new. Um, there are version updates quite often. We have to restart that. Um, and we actually, yeah, we, we stay up. Um, also, our database is still small enough to entirely fit in memory. So without writing a single line of caching or cache ex uh, expiration, we've got a fully cached um, uh, system. Um, this, as you can well expect, makes read performance really, really high um, for, very, for, for little effort. Um, when the time is right, in terms of how we would scale this part of our system, um, we would eventually move memcached off to Elastic Cache. We might move off RabbitMQ and onto simple queue service. Um, the, we might move to uh, DynamoDB for storage. The only bit that we actually have to self-host is the Datomic transactor. But because that transactor only has to transact writes, it doesn't have to deal with query, and it does all of its indexing in the background, um, it's going to be really difficult to actually saturate a machine that's just doing that. So we can just buy one really, really big, beefy Amazon Web Server node, um, and yeah. 
The other thing about Datomic is that because it, you can only have one transactor in your system, um, it has traditional failover high availability semantics. Um, so you can keep two running, um, and if the, second, if the first one dies, the second one comes in and Amazon's auto-scaling will then provision up a new um, backup. Um, and Okay, so before the in summary. So when we look at those events coming out of our ClojureScript application, they're coming um, out of JavaScript down, down the, uh, um, the pipe to the web node. The web node writes it to the transactor. The transactor stores it in storage and broadcasts it out to the peers and to the cache. Um, by the time that's, as that's happening, it, the events are also being enqueued into Rabbit. Rabbit tells Worker. Um, and by the time Worker is actually picking those events up to start calculating it and uh, figuring out what it needs to do, those, that stuff is already in cache. Um, Worker does its aggregations and calculations, writes its values to Datomic, and the next time that you go, so you finish a cog and you go to the leaderboard to see where you are in the leaderboard now, by the time that leaderboard refreshes, it's already been through web, through Worker, cached, and the page is rendered. Um, and again, can't hammer on this enough, we didn't write a single line of caching code. Um, so our web servers build our pages directly out of memcached. Um, our emails are sent out of memcached. Um, yeah, it, it's really cool, I think. So in summary, using event sourcing, which is the, the model that we use for our client side, and using immutable data, the, the two of them work together really, really well. Um, Closure code, which we saw a little bit of, is concise and it's much easier to reason about because it's stateless and it's pure functions over, over transforming data rather than mixing um, behavior and state in one place. And um, I hope you agree, Datomic cuts out a lot of the hassle in building scalable and distributed systems. And that's it. Um, before I go, we've started the Cape Town Closure User Group. Next meeting is on the 18th of May. Um, I hope there are a lot of questions. Um, uh, I'd like to answer the, all of them. Um, and if you come and join us then, I'll, I'll make sure to get all of those questions answered. Also, I'll be able to answer questions over lunch. Um, I hope you guys have gone and, and taken a look at the notes as well. Um, there's lots of links to more about Datomic and Clojure. There's some great videos by Rich Hickey, the designer of both the language and the database, which I think every developer should watch. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, can Datomic scale to handle lots of writes, or is it just not really suitable for that? It can, but you obviously because it has a single transactor in the system, you'd need a really, really, really beefy server. Um, but again, because that, that machine doesn't need to do anything but writes, you can optimize the, the hell out of it. Um, yeah. So. Any others? Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of how you got to that architecture? Because, I mean, it looks a very specific, you're solving very specific problems. Datomic, it sounds very, it's, it's a very narrow field of, of kind of um, requirements. And, and also, how do you, how did you, you know, how do you even think about using something like Datomic? It's just, it's just so novel. So we got to closure because um, it, it was sort of, it was the right thing at the right time. Um, 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 found Clojure, that was a year ago, um, committed to using Clojure for our front end and our back end code. Um, and then Datomic launched uh, about seven months ago, um, and it's from the same guys. Datomic is implemented in Clojure. Um, it is built on many of the same principles that Clojure is built on, immutable data, functional data, um, a, a strict notion of time in your data. Um, and. Yeah, um, we use Datomic in a very particular way, but um, oh, and we are solving a very particular problem with Datomic. Uh, you can solve many other kinds of problems with it, um, and I'd be very happy to unpack what you might be thinking of using it for. Um, it, it's still very new, um, but um, I'm standing here because I wanted to be 
widespread and want other people to use it because I think it, it's really, really valuable and it saved us a lot of time and money and effort. Hey, um, I'm curious how big your user base is, roughly how many writes you do um, and, and reads you do? That's a fantastic question and I'd love to know myself. Um, we, as I said, we just launched. Um, we've been so focused on dealing with all of the client um, um, deployment issues that we've been dealing with. Um, so we're actually in the process right now of spinning up an entirely separate cluster to throw the 300,000 events we already have in our system at it and to measure everything, measure rights on, this, on the worker, on the web servers, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and once we have all that information, I actually do plan to share it with everyone so that you guys can see how, how this thing is performing. Um, and it, it's a fantastic question. <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer you more. Uh, wow, I'm loud. Um, uh, given the centrality of time in the closure model, are you, do you use NTP? Do you keep NTP HA? Do you use multiple time sources? You don't it, care. It, it's all um, UTC. Everything is stored there. So this is a problem we're going to have to start solving. Once we start moving into different markets, we're going to have to understand local time versus our source of truth time. Um, the other thing about Datomic is that um, it's difficult to model two notions of time together and get the same query performance on both. Datomic implicitly timestamps everything, and that you can you, the query performance on that is very, very good. But if you had to, say, timestamp entities with some other date, maybe the date that things happened in JavaScript, which we do, that query performance is not nearly as good. Um, so different notions of time, when you have more than one notion of time, it can be a bit difficult, and that's something we're still uh, settling out. Uh, hi there. So Lisp can be quite a flexible, um, malleable language. Uh, so how do you structure your code uh, so that everyone in the team can participate and contribute effectively? So um, everything's in GitHub. Everything is in Clojure in GitHub. Um, we all use the same editor, Emacs, which helps a lot. Um, the code is structured Pretty tra traditionally, we have uh, um, database layer, database code, um, core logic code, domain specific logic code, um, view code, emailer code. Um, but because it's all, it all kind of looks the same and it all feels the same and has all the same shape, um, we're quite comfortable moving around. And we're only three developers at the moment and we're quite cross-functional. Um, everybody has written some data code and some web code and some, you know, uh, we're all everywhere. Um, because we're writing much simpler code, um, it's a lot easier to test and to understand and to, um, uh, yeah, to, to share knowledge on. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, thanks. Thanks very much, Robert. Thanks, guys.